So when starting chemistry, we often start with Lewis structures for bonding. We had this idea that there's an electrostatic attraction between electrons shared between two sets of nuclei, and that the positive charge of the nuclei and the negative charge of the electrons attracts each other. What we want to do here is we want to expand on that to be able to explain some of the things we see in chemistry that aren't really readily explained by just that feature. So this is called molecular orbital theory, or MO theory. And if we can kind of start, one of the things that's important is to understand that when we draw a representation like this, where a hydrogen has an electron and a hydrogen has an electron, that that electron is really not a dot and it's not best thought of as a particle kind of moving around, but rather is a wave type um, structure that, that we call an orbit. So, so over here, we've drawn a 1s orbital for a hydrogen atom and a 1s orbital for a hydrogen atom. And what we want to do is we want to take those two orbitals and combine them into molecular orbitals. And a molecular orbital is just like an atomic orbital, except it's distributed over part of or the entire molecule. Okay. And the difficulty in doing that is, is quite a bit. And so the mathematics behind it, we often try and simplify. So what I'm going to try and do here is is show you some very simple non-mathematical treatment of that. Now we're going to call um, this atomic orbital chi-1 and this atomic orbital chi-2, those are both 1s orbitals, and we want to look at what we can get by combining them. So one of the things we can get is that if we kind of think of this mathematically, we can combine these two waves constructively where they add together. And in order to do that in molecular orbital, usually what we'll draw is we'll have kind of the one orbital with the other orbital like that. Now, I'm going to do that, but instead I'm going to draw this in kind of a different way. I'm going to draw it where we just have circles. Because one of the things that we want to be able to distinguish here is that these have kind of a, uh, I don't know, something similar to a phase that goes with them. And so when we have them constructively interfering, uh, we want to draw them in kind of the same shape. And so we're going to draw these not shaded in, and this is going to be a bonding molecular orbital. So basically what we're doing is we're taking the one orbital from the one hydrogen, this 1s orbital, and we're taking the 1s orbital from the other hydrogen, and we're, con we're combining them in a constructive interference pattern that gives us this combined molecular orbital. This is a bonding orbital, which means that when we add those together constructively, most of our electron density lies with, between the two nuclei along the internuclear axis. So what we do is we gain a stability by combining those two things, which explains why the things bond in the first place. However, it turns out that there's, there's more than one orbital, so if we start with two orbitals, that we always have to end up with the same number of molecular orbitals as we came up with. So it turns out there's another way to combine these where it's destructive. And this would be written as chi 1 minus chi 2. Okay. And in that case, we end up with a, a different result. And actually, our energy goes up. And our picture for this would look a little more like this. We'd have one in phase and one out of phase. I probably should have switched these, but oh well. It's very symmetric, so it doesn't really matter. And this one, we actually have very little electron density in between the nuclei. It's actually kind of on the opposite ends, and so that's unstable, and it's putting the nuclei closer together without the electron density to stabilize them. And actually, if you measure from here to here, this is going to have a bigger increase, a greater amount of repulsion, and this will uh, have attraction. So we see a bigger height change for that. So when we have these two molecular orbitals, um, what we can then do is we can go through and say, okay, well, how many electrons do we have? So each hydrogen came with one electron, and so therefore we can put one electron here and one electron with opposing spin there. So by doing this, instead of having one electron in the 1s and one electron in the 1s, we end up with two electrons into this molecular orbital, and because there's a stabilizing effect, that creates a stable bond. So this would predict that H2 is a molecule. Now, something we can do with molecular orbital theories, we can get in a little deeper than we do in valence bond theory. We can look at some things that aren't common. So for instance, what if you had an ion, polyatomic ion, H2 plus? Would that exist? So according to molecular orbital theory, we can go through and say, okay, well, if we only had one electron, and we had a similar combination of orbitals, this would, would be able to exist because we would have one electron going into a bonding state, and therefore we would experience stabilization. H2, of course, also exists. But what if we did something like H2 and we threw in an extra electron? 
Well, if we were to throw an extra electron in, if we were to put that into here, now we are definitely weakening the molecule because now we're adding an anti-bonding effect and we're adding more anti-bonding effect than we get from bonding from one of these, probably not from two, but it's possible. Uh, and so we'd expect this to probably exist but not be nearly as stable as this and we might expect it to change quickly given the opportunity. Now, if we extend that to having two extra electrons, now we can be sure that this is not going to exist. Because now we're adding in, we have a two bonding and two anti bonding, and the anti bonding having a bigger increase in energy than we get from stabilizing energy, that's not going to be a stable molecule. And another thing that's very similar to that is two helium atoms. So two helium atoms, each with two electrons each, even though we're looking at the same orbital combination, so 1s and a 1s combining to form this molecular orbital and this molecular orbital, uh, this would not be a stable compound, and therefore we'd expect that to not bond. And that's what we see, right? Now it turns out you could do a helium-2 and then remove an electron, and that would take you back to here, and that, we would think, would be able to be stable. And then, of course, helium-2 with two electrons removed also would work according to the molecular orbital theory here, although we are getting quite a bit of positive charge on that, which can always be concerning. So let's take this and then we're going to take this a little step further into something a little more complicated to try and understand something a little deeper than just hydrogen and, and why helium doesn't bond. Alright, so part two here we're going to look at something that's slightly more complicated but not a lot more complicated to try and get the basic ideas across to you. So here we have a fluorine F2 molecule. The valence bond theory, we would draw our Lewis structure like this. We have a single bond, we would have six uh, electrons on each fluorine that are paired, so three pairs three lone pairs, and, and what we want to do is kind of take this and go back to just the beginning fluorine here, which is 2s2, 2p5, and try and construct a molecular orbital set from that. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to start with the one fluorine. So let's do this one in red. So we have a 2s orbital, and then we have three q orbitals. So we kind of have a set of three, one, two, three. We have two px, two py, and two pz. So if we were to draw representations like this, we have kind of one of those, and then we have a px, py, or I'm sorry, we have px, py, and then pz is a little hard to draw, but it'll come in and out of the board. So we're just going to kind of draw it like that because that's all I can kind of do with that. So we have our set of p orbitals, our s orbital, and then we have the same thing on another fluorine atom. We have a 2s atomic orbital, 2px, 2py, and 2pz. And what we want to do is construct molecular orbitals. Now there's a, there's a proper method to combine these. One of the rules is that if things are orthogonal to each other, that they really can't mix. And that means that if things are perpendicular, so for instance, a 2py on this can't really mix with a 2pz or 2px on this. They have to be in the same axis, so to speak, in order to get any overlap where they can actually change. So one of the things we're going to start with here is, well, which ones of these can combine? So the 2s and the 2s are able to combine into a set of molecular orbitals, just like we saw with hydrogen. So we're going to end up with a stabilizing and a bonding, and that's going to be you know, the two that are in phase. And then we're going to end up with an anti-bonding uh, that's going to be a bigger increase than this is a decrease, where they're out of phase like this. So there's, there's two atomic orbitals combining to form two molecular orbitals. And then we have these. Now, the x orbitals, you can imagine that this and the one that's over here, same thing, are going to combine quite nicely. So we're going to get kind of a x and x orbital. So there's our, there's our molecular orbital. And we need a phase for that. So we're going to have the phases for that align so that there's overlap between the two things that are in phase. And so that's going to be a bonding interaction. And we're going to see that stabilize. So that's going to come from here, from the x, from the x. And that means that we need an anti bonding to go with that. And the anti bonding is just going to be the exact same overlap, but it's going to be out of phase. Where one of these is like this, and the other one that, 
that, it's going to be a very big increase. Now, those get the biggest amount of overlap, and therefore they get the biggest bonding stabilization and destabilization. Now, the Y and the Zs, on the other hand, are not going to interact at the same level, but we can still see that we're going to get a similar type of thing. Now, it's probably easiest to look at the Ys for these, so we're looking at this kind of structure here, because the Z is going to be a little bit challenging. So for the Ys, we're going to see kind of a decrease down to here. And for that YY overlap, we're looking at two sets. So in one, we have these two orbitals in phase, like this. And then we're also going to see an anti-bonding effect, although not too strong, for the same type of thing over here. And this one is going to be like this, where they're out of phase from each other. Right. Now the Z is going to do the exact same thing. I'll try this in red and see how we do. But we're going to kind of have a bonding interaction. And I'm trying to draw that where this is in front of the board and this is behind the board. And they're, they're in line with each other. Uh, and that's going to be actually the exact same energy as this one. So we're going to end up with two molecular orbitals at the same degeneracy. And then we're going to get the exact same thing going on here. Where we're going to get the same destabilization, and we're going to end up with two, or two orbitals uh, that are slightly destabilized. Now, it turns out that the gain and the loss here in energy are pretty comparable, which means that um, we're not going to see a huge amount of stuff going on here. So let's go and look at how many electrons we have now. So for valence electrons, each fluorine has seven, so we have 14 valence electrons to fill in. So we're going to have four go into here gives us a slight anti-bonding total effect. Um, and then we're going to have two go into here, and that's six. We have another eight, so there's ten, and there's fourteen total. So when we look at this molecular orbital, all of a sudden we can tie in some features back to our original valence set. So for instance, what's our bond in this? Well, our bond is actually this right here. So this and this combine to really not do anything, but this is the one feature over here that shows a bonding effect. So we're seeing that the px orbitals from the two fluorine atoms are overlapping to form a bonding molecular orbital, and that's where our interaction lies. Okay, so that's this. But then if we go through and look, okay, well what are all these other 12 electrons? Well, two of them are these, two are these, and then eight of them are those. Which is interesting, because what that would imply is that when we look at these 12 electrons, even though in this picture they all look very similar, they're not. Two of these electrons are these. Two of these electrons are those. And actually, it's not even two that are localized on one fluorine atom, because remember, this is a molecular orbital. It's distributed over the entire molecule. So really, these two electrons are here. And these two electrons aren't here, but rather they're here. And these four electrons are you know in these in these py uh, molecular orbital combinations, and so one of the things we can do to confirm this is do what's called photoelectron spectroscopy. And in photoelectron spectroscopy, we basically uh, remove electrons from this uh, by applying a certain voltage or type of light to see exactly how much energy it takes to remove these electrons. And what we find is, is we find that we have four electrons that have the same uh, degeneracy with, with respect to photoelectron spectroscopy, and then we have another four that are slightly separated from there. And then we have, and so we can follow this down the line, and so we can actually figure out how much energy it takes to remove an electron from here, and to remove an electron from here, and so on and so on and so on. And we can match the photoelectron spectroscopy essentially with this type of diagram that can then confirm. Now, if we were to go through and say, okay, which of these four are the four removed? Uh, from here, with just a Lewis structure, we don't really have any way to kind of make sense of that. We can't say, oh, these two are different from these two somehow, maybe from the origin of the orbitals, but at that point we come to the molecular orbital picture, we bring all of it together. Another thing that happens is, is if we swap this out, and you can ignore most of the drawing on here about fluorine, but if we switch this to oxygen for a second, we end up with a very similar set of molecular orbitals, but oxygen doesn't have 14 electrons, it has 12. So if we think about 12 electrons, what that means is that we're now going to get rid of two of these when we go through and put together our molecular orbital diagram. So 
So now for oxygen, we have our single bond here, our sigma interaction here, but we also have a net of a pi interaction here because we have two of these with two in the antibody, but we have two more now in the bonding phase. And so now we see a double bond, but in addition to that, something really cool with oxygen is so we have two electrons in these degenerate orbitals, and because it takes energy to pair the electrons, they're gonna remain unpaired, which means that oxygen is paramagnetic. And we can actually measure the paramagnetism of oxygen molecules. Now, if we look at a Lewis structure, that, that doesn't make any sense. Lewis structure of oxygen shows eight electrons that are in four pairs, and then we have the four bonding electrons. So in this Lewis structure, to say that two of these electrons somewhere are unpaired is really not something that, that is comprehensible. But in the molecular orbital diagram, it makes perfect sense. These two electrons end up in degenerate orbitals, they split, and therefore we have a paramagnetic result. And so this is a case that we really can't easily explain why this happens, but in our molecular orbital theory, we can. So molecular orbital theory is something that gives us a, a lot better explaining power for some of the unique details we find when we go looking for what happens when we combine atoms into molecules.